Thank you for staying with us right here on Good Morning Kenya. Now, today being a Wednesday, it is Women at the Forefront, and that is the segment that I am about to uh, begin right now, or actually we are beginning right now. And on Women at the Forefront, we get to bring you women who are doing exemplary well in different fields. And today is no different as I am joined by one Purity Karemi, who is well advanced in the tourism industry. She she is also an author and works with the elderly as well as the community at large. Purity, welcome to Good Morning Kenya. Thank you so much. We are Thank pleased you for to have me. We are pleased to have you here. Thank you. And now, um, as I was going through your bio, I, I read that you pride yourself, or from a very early age, you pride yourself in impacting people's lives positively. Maybe how did that come to be, you know, from such an early age? Yes, you're right. It came from an early age mm -hmm. because um, even before I started my walk with God, mm -hmm. um, I used to visit orphanages. I used to visit the needy and donate what I could. Okay, but then um, I didn't I know that. I understand we're having an issue with okay. your mic. Okay. So we should be coming back to you in a moment. But uh, as I have said, we have Purity Karemi. And she's doing a lot of things. She has a ministry where she is working with the community. She is working with people who are elderly, you know, people who are suffering from different kinds of um, um, ailments as the elderly, as well as, she, um, or rather, she is also working with adolescents and trying to just um, teach them on the dangers of drug abuse and try to just empower them into being great people in the society. And that is why we have her here as our woman at the forefront. And um, I believe your, your microphone is okay now. We can, we can get back to you. Okay. 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 Uh Yes, as I was saying, I used to do the community work, mm -hmm. even without the ministry, because I'm now in ministry. Yeah. Um, from an early age, I used to visit the orphanages. I had a passion for the needy. Mm -hmm. And it is later on that I came to realize that it's actually an area that, um, that even God would love me to, to focus on. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. Yeah. And um, then I was anointed for the ministry. And that's when now um, I started now taking it even more serious. Yeah. So uh, mostly uh, you will find me in the villages, um, in the villages uh, with the poor, the needy, and um, especially even uh, people that are not able to raise school fees. And the kind of help I offer is not only financially, mm -hmm. because I came to realize that uh, sometimes you can categorize the help as only financials. So there is even the emotional part mm -hmm. and the mental part, but that is all now from a spiritual aspect. Yeah. Okay, I get that. Uh, before you got into all this, you used to work in the tourism industry, but I just want to touch a bit on that. Yeah. Maybe how would you say that tourism, um, you being in the tourism industry, impacted your life to... Um, probably what you're doing right now. Has it helped in any way? Did it help? Okay, I believe it has helped because um, first of all, um, let me just go back a little bit because the tourism part, I did it in Germany. So I was uh, blessed enough to be able to fly out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been there for many years. Mm -hmm. So there is also an, ex an exposure that I've, re I've gotten from uh, being in uh, the European country, mm -hmm. especially German being one of the uh, one of the, um, the strong countries in terms of even economy, technology. So you can learn, one can learn so much from being in such a country. Yeah. So I ventured into tourism because uh, I love tourism. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something actually I thought that I'll do for, I thought I would be doing it even now. Um, and I worked at Frankfurt Airport. That was as a hostess. And then I also worked in travel agencies. So how it has impacted what I'm doing now or the connection of it, mm -hmm. I think because when, when you work in tourism, especially like uh, one of the biggest airports uh, in the world, because Frankfurt Airport is very big, you get to meet very many people. Yeah? 
uh, millions of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think the meeting with people, the interacting with people, mm -hmm. it teaches you how to be friendly, it teaches you how to be patient with people, and these are the same, the same uh, virtues or the same uh, attributes that are also needed when we are helping in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, the airport is also a busy place, so you have to have a kind of self-control. You have to have even a love for the people. And I find this is working for me even as I'm helping the people in the community mm -hmm. uh, because it's not always a uh, walk in the park. So you have, uh, you have to remind yourself that you are in it for the love and then the patience now that I've already experienced from uh, working as, uh, in the tourism industry. Yeah. yeah. And um, is there, would you say there's a particular moment in your life whereby it made you believe that, you know, nothing is impossible and whatever you put your mind to, you can definitely do it. Uh, you mean in the tourism part or generally, Just generally in my in life? life yeah. yeah, of course there is. And this is where now my ministry comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I became alive. I came alive when, uh, when I connected with God, when I started my work with God. Mm -hmm. It's not that I didn't know God because I was raised a Catholic, mm. so I knew God. But when I gave my life to Christ, a new journey started, mm -hmm. totally new. Mm -hmm. um, I always say that uh, when you find your purpose, it's like God reintroduced you to yourself. So that's what happened to me mm -hmm. because everything changed. Uh, the desires changed. Okay, not all of them, but there are some desires that became secondary because God showed me that there is now something greater. You know, because mm -hmm. there is good and there is greater. Mm -hmm. So I would say that um, knowing God, knowing God, that was the turning point for me. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you are really passionate about working with the elderly. How yes. did that come about? And why specific elderly people, that is those who are having different ailments? Yeah, actually that did not come long time. It's, it's, it's quite new. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll explain that. I've been working and reaching out to the poor, the orphans, the needy. For me, it has been whoever is in need. I had not specialized in, mm -hmm. in an area. Mm -hmm. uh, but t 2019, I felt the leading of the Lord that I should, I should take a certain course mm -hmm. to study how to take care of the elderly, especially those with uh, Alzheimer's. Yeah. Uh, dementia mm. and those with uh, those who have experienced stroke yeah. and now this is not just about the elderly because we have people even uh, with 50 60 who have experienced stroke and then there there is the effect of stroke so I felt the, that I should take that course it's not something that I would have imagined I resisted at first, but mm -hmm. later on I felt that uh, this 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 was the leading of the Lord so I did that uh, without knowing that I will, I will, uh, uh, I'm going to extend that even here at mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. So I started, I started that course, mm -hmm. how to take care of the elderly, how to take care of those who have, uh, who have uh, Alzheimer, dementia, and uh, and what I mentioned, and um, and I also worked uh, after standing, I worked in Germany, uh, taking care of the elderly and and the, the patients. We are, who, are, who are ailing from those sicknesses or mm -hmm. recovering from that. So, so that's when then I felt that that's something I'm supposed to be doing even in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So I started realizing that the reason why the Lord wanted me to do that, it's because it's badly needed in Kenya. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because when I compare how the, the, in Europe, how they take care of the elderly and uh, such cases of uh, people who have experienced such sicknesses. Yeah. Uh, I think in Kenya, it's, it's, it's not as, as, uh, as the issue is not um, well known or, or people are not well taught. So I also see here in Kenya sometimes uh, people mean well, maybe you have a relative who, who, uh, who is suffering from the effect of stroke. Mm -hmm. Um, you mean well, you want to help, but because you have not been taught, like I didn't know, I, I was taught also. So because you don't know, you end up actually even worsening the situation. 
And maybe I can give a small example so that uh, you, you understand. For example, a person who has suffered from stroke yeah. or even uh, patients with the dementia, you know these kind of sicknesses, they affect the brain. Mm -hmm. So even the cognitive parts are affected. So the, the kind of uh, study, the kind of cause I started, I studied, sorry, mm -hmm. we were taught how to help these patients or to help the elderly to recover what can be recovered mm -hmm. and also to help them retain what is what is still there yeah, yeah. so for example now I wanted to give an example when uh, when uh, someone has stroke the effect of it or dementia sometimes they might not be able to hold a spoon while they are feeding mm -hmm. yeah so you see if they can try a little bit we are uh, we should encourage them to do so but you see now some family members, uh, because of love, you want to take the spoon and just do it for them. This is wrong, mm -hmm. you see. Because when you take the spoon and do it for them, uh, the brain remains, remains inactive. The, the part of the, the brain that was affected by the sickness, it remains inactive. Mm -hmm. So I do that through the ministry, helping this, uh, the awareness, raising the awareness, because I have realized this kind of thing, it's being done in the hospitals. It's not that it's not there. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, it's not enough when we limit it to the hospitals. Because even in the hospitals, the, the, uh, people have to pay for those kind of things. Eh? Mm -hmm. And not everyone has the money to pay for, for those, uh, those kind mm -hmm. of things. So I think we should extend it in the community. We should extend it in the villages yeah. and where we are. So that even as we are living with our elderly, you know what happens, uh, I, the, the main reason of the, the study that I studied is to bring dignity back to these people. Because it's maybe it's an elderly person. This person was, was, maybe this person was a manager somewhere when they were younger. Mm -hmm. Maybe she was a teacher somewhere. Mm -hmm. Maybe it, it was a boss somewhere. But when this sickness strike or when they get older, they behave a kind of way so people might disrespect them mm -hmm. and they still even when they have the problem in the brain they still feel disrespected so my work or the work that I'm helping others to realize is we need to treat these people still with the dignity because they are still for example uh, my, uh, uh, for myself Karimi or purity even when I'm older I will still be purity I will still like that dignity mm. to be accorded to me so that's why we are doing that yeah and i can imagine you know you transitioning from you know tourism being you know having worked in one of the biggest airports and trans transitioning into a job that many people really wouldn't want to do a job that many people would look down upon you know looking after the elderly it seems like why would you want to leave such a career to get into this? So I can just imagine the kind of passion that you have into that. While, doing, while making that transition, did you have people who were, you know, trying to tell you or, you know, speaking negatively about it in your mind or trying to tell you, trying to question, why do you want to make this transition? Yes, I did. I did because, uh, you know, getting to, to work at Frankfurt Airport mm -hmm. is not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. It's something I had desired. It's something I had prayed for. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, I felt like I had achieved something. So, of course, there were people who are not understanding. And, you know, some people may think even you're foolish taking such kind of a decision. Mm -hmm. But as for me, I had the conviction that this is the way I should go. It wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not easy for me. Um, but by the grace of God, I was able to understand because I was already uh, standing the word of God. Mm -hmm. So I was able to understand that at the end of the day, there will be a reward for me. And I still miss the tourism aspect. I still miss uh, the airport. I miss uh, all that pertains with tourism because I love it. Um, but still, there are things I've gained now that I didn't have then. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm now an author through the ministry, yeah. Yeah? yeah? So there are things that I've gained that I didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And I still get to travel because now I travel under the ministry, yeah? Mm -hmm. So also through the ministry I travel, yeah. yeah. You've spoken about you being an author and I can see you have two books with you right there. If you can just tell us um, a bit about each of the books and how they came to be. Yes, of course. So this is my first book. Mm -hmm. I don't know, should I show it? Yeah, 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 <laughs> sure. 
-hmm. This is uh, Seek First the Kingdom of God. Uh, is the first book I wrote. I didn't know that I can write books mm -hmm. until uh, I walked with God and then after several years that's when uh, lo the, the Lord was releasing a prophecy through several people and then to myself also that I should write books. What I know is I've always loved writing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, I can even write my prayers since I was in school. I love writing. Sometimes I might, I might be going through a tough, a tough uh, situation mm -hmm. and I will feel it's easier for me to write instead of praying or speaking. Mm -hmm. So I have those moments. So, um, but I didn't know that it was something in me that the Lord had put the gift of writing in me. Mm -hmm. So Seek First the Kingdom of God is my first book. Mm -hmm. It's but actually all the, my books, because there are three of them, they are birthed through the experiences that the Lord has taken me through. Mm -hmm. um, I write these books uh, because um, the Lord has taught me through the Holy Spirit and also through some servants of God that the, uh, Christianity is not based only in spiritual things. We can prosper, we, we, can, we can advance in very many ways. We can be others, we can be owners of institutions that take care of the community. So through these books, I help people understand that we have a purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm very passionate about helping people discover their purpose. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, the moment I discovered my purpose, that's when I felt that my life had started. Yeah? So, so I want to help people and I thank God that he helps me. I do help people discover their purposes. So through the, uh, writing the books, I'm trying to explain that Christianity is not about the prayer, the fasting, the church. It's about also fulfilling our purposes in the marketplaces. Uh, wherever you find yourself, if you find yourself, for example now Vivian, you're fulfilling your purpose. Mm -hmm. I want to believe that. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself at the hospital, you're a doctor, you're maybe a lawyer, a judge, you're fulfilling your purpose. So it's helping people not to limit the work of God uh, to the, just the church and the spiritual issue. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, I didn't know I was an author. It's God who pulled that out of me. Yeah? yeah. So I think uh, especially the young people, I want to encourage them uh, even to write books. This is, a, uh, this is another thing now I'm encouraging uh, the, everyone, especially the young people, uh, write books. Because, uh, you know, when you've not written a book, you think this is huge. Mm -hmm. This is uh, unachievable. This is not for me. You think there are people who are supposed to write books? This is not for me. Of course, not everyone will write books. But what I want to say is, it's not like an, a mountain that cannot be conquered. And then in the digital world, we have the audio books, we have the, the e-books. So I'm encouraging people to write and also to read books. Because like I meet people who tell me, it's very hard for me to read or I'm so busy. Then I help them understand there is audio books. You can be cooking, you can be washing utensils, and you can be listening mm -hmm. to something that is uh, helping you to develop yourself. Mm. Um, and then... Um, the, the other book? The other book, yeah. yeah. The other book is about fasting, biblical fasting. Mm -hmm. It's actually a sequel uh, from this one, but expounded on one topic of fasting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is another topic that I'm passionate about. <laughs> to the Christians mm -hmm. that, uh, because you know, I'm passionate about uh, doing what we are doing with, with, with the right spin. Uh, I believe that we don't have so much time to waste because if I can give an example of, of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. when we see how he was functioning, he had an urgency. He mm -hmm. was saying that I have to work uh, because the night is coming and I cannot work. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of uh, urgency and spin I like to work with. And um, that's why I talked about fasting. There are things we should not be wasting our time fasting about. Because we want now to save time for other things. We want to be great at the marketplaces. We want to be great even what we are doing. If I can give an example of myself, sometimes even the 24 hours is not enough. I want to write books. I want to, to be there for the community. I, I am a mother. I want to be there for my son. 
So fasting, there is just one principle that the Lord taught me. We do not fast for bread. This is basically any material things, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I'm just encouraging uh, Christians, we can use our time wisely because if we start fasting for bread, these are things that the Lord has said, I will hand them to you. I will give them to you. We don't need to go and, uh, and beg him for them. Mm -hmm. Because you see, fasting is humbling yourself. It's like begging. And this is something very powerful. The fasting is a powerful weapon. It's a powerful tool, but it shouldn't be used wisely. Mm -hmm. Because when we start to go for seven days fasting, 40 days fasting, you're fasting for bread, you're fasting for a car, you're fasting for a house, it's not biblical because no one in the Bible fasted for bread, no one fasted for material thing. As a matter of fact, everyone that we see in the Bible, they were very busy fulfilling their purposes. No one even prayed for bread. No one even prayed for these things that we are now praying about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because they understood one principle that I now want uh, to pass to the people what the Lord has passed to me. Mm -hmm. Follow your uh, wake up in the morning, get your timetable, follow your purpose, and uh, the other things that will just be handed to you as long as you're in your place of purpose. So that's why I wrote the biblical fasting okay. to help people understand why we fast and what we shouldn't fast about. Okay, I want to get back into fulfilling one's uh, purpose. And if there's one thing that hinders most of us to fulfilling our purpose is what we call imposter syndrome or self-doubt, where you feel like you don't think you are really worthy of some of these things. You don't think you're good enough to write a book. You don't think you're good enough to be at a place where you, at the place where you feel deep in your heart you need to be. How does one push past that? Okay, for me, I believe uh, the issue of uh, having a connection with God, a good relationship with God, I believe that is uh, 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 fundamental because that's what helped me. Mm -hmm. uh, because God will also be a kind, uh, uh, even your cheerleader. He will be cheering you on. I see him doing that to me. Mm -hmm. well, when this, the fear comes and I think I cannot do this thing, uh, you know when you walk with God, you know when he's speaking to you. So I feel him pushing me out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You mm -hmm. know, even when you read the word of God, he's, the Lord says, I, I am the lift of your hand. Yeah, mm -hmm. And arise and shine. So it's just good things that, uh, that he tells us. So I think the one thing, uh, having a good relationship with God helps mm -hmm. because actually it's very difficult to, to recognize your purpose if you don't have a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. It's possible, of course, but I think it's easier when you're ready in, in that relationship. Yeah. Um, the other thing is um, about the, the fear. The fear. Yeah. I would like to believe everyone, everyone experiences that fear. Because even as I was coming here, of course I asked myself, uh, what do I want to offer to the people? I don't want to come to such a platform and then I'm just talking about things that are not helping the people. So there is that fear in everyone. Mm -hmm. Am I going to give my best? But uh, I, I like to, there is a, a pastor, a teacher of the Bible who is uh, Joyce Meyer. She likes to say, do it afraid. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn the, the, we have to learn how to overcome the fear because it will always be there. It will never go away completely. Yeah. It will always be there. And it's a good thing because if it, it is not there, we might overestimate ourselves and end up not even uh, doing the giving our best because we are overestimating ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the fear is not a bad thing, and uh, anyone with that is not something strange. We just learn uh, through even uh, uh, educating yourself, reading books, and and even preparing yourself in the private. Uh, for example, now what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. I prepared myself in private and not because I had this appointment even years back because now you keep practicing uh, uh, with in a mind that maybe a door will open somewhere and mm -hmm. I need to be ready for this so you practice in secret mm -hmm. so when the doors when the door open that's not when you're starting from zero yeah they say yeah. when opportunity meets preparation that's when success is bound to happen because exactly. you are already yeah. you had already prepared yourself so when the opportunity comes yeah. you just get into it yeah. um, uh, maybe if I may ask you what is your greatest inspiration in everything that you're doing because you're doing a lot you know with the with the community with the ministry that you have right now what is your greatest inspiration 
uh, my greatest inspiration. You mean like my goal, my zeal? Yeah, what, what keeps you going? What is that inspiration that makes you, you know, every morning once you wake up, you want to keep going because there's something that is inspiring you? Okay. Uh, for me, it's, uh, I am, I'll just come back again to God because I, I love my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's knowing that I am placing God because I like to do something that I know this place is God. Mm -hmm. And even as I'm, I'm, I'm helping out there, yeah. I, do not, I, I do not see myself like I'm helping the people. For example, if I come and help you as Lillian, yeah. for me, I do not see myself as I'm helping Lillian. For me, I see myself as I'm doing this to God. So you, you know this kind of ministry, sometimes you will even help people and they will come and even do bad things to you later on. Mm -hmm. I experienced this too. But it doesn't affect me because when I did it to, when I did it to you in the first place, I was not doing it to, uh, to you. Mm -hmm. I was doing it to God through you. So I think that is my inspiration and I love it to see when the standard of people are raised. I think I should mention also something. I have gone through tough times. I was not, I was raised well, I didn't lack anything, mm -hmm. but when the Lord started working with me, there are things he permitted to come in my life. So I found myself in a place of lack, and this was very hard for me. And that's the time now the Lord started speaking to me about uh, the needy. Because you see, if I didn't lack, I would not have understood about the needy. Mm -hmm. You know, I do go in the villages. Sometimes I enter into their houses. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a something, it's the rain, it's raining, it's just bad. You can't even imagine how somebody can live there. But you see, because of the experience God has taken me through, the, the lack and other things, I've written about all of that in my book. In, in, in my books because I've experienced that. It's my own experience. And the revelation that I've been bad, they are through those experiences. Mm -hmm. So I am passionate because I went through that. So I know how, how it feels to lack. I know how it feels not to have enough food. Mm -hmm. I know how it feels that you have a bill to pay, you have things to pay, and you do not have the money for that. So I know how it feels, and this is why I feel when I'm dealing with uh, when I'm dealing with the people in the community, the needy, I feel at home yeah. because I relate with them, and actually I, I feel very comfortable there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to uh, I want to get back to um, you working with the elderly, and I understand that um, in most European countries, European countries, we have um, elderly homes. You know, when people aged. Yeah. age they tend to take them to the elderly homes yeah. but that is not really something we do here in the country because we look after our own um you know elderly people we look after our own grandfathers we look after our own great grandmothers uh, for those who are there do you feel like it is something that we should adopt as kenyans whereby we have homes for the elderly because there are those who sometimes are just left you know their children grow up they live and they don't really come back to check on them or anything. Maybe they just send money and that's it. So is this something that we should adopt or we just stick to our ways where we stay with our elderly people? Yeah. Thank you so much for asking that question because I really wanted to touch about that. Mm. Um, yes, in Europe, like where I worked is uh, an elderly home. Yeah. It's well established. Almost in every city, they have several of them. It's very well established and uh, even the insurance takes care of that and, uh, and those who are well up, they, they can pay their bills for the elderly homes. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to Kenya, this is even a new thing, uh, an elderly home. Yeah. There are some people even in Kenya, they have never heard of elderly homes. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, we have very very few in Kenya, very few. Mm. And uh, the thing is, you know, our tradition, it's very different with the tradition. It has been very different with the tradition in Europe. But now things are changing. Families, you used to be there for your relatives. Uh, you used to even uh, to, to, to have your grandmother, your great grandmother mm -hmm. with you at home. But now this is changing. We have uh, elderly people who are suffering. And their children, like you're saying, they have left home. And also we have in the country uh, cases of uh, high drug abuse, like alcoholism. Yeah. So these children who are supposed to be taking care of their parents or their grandparents, 
they are out there drinking. They don't even know themselves. They don't even know their identity. So the community is in crisis. So because the elderly are now forced, uh, they, they, are, they are sick, they are not strong enough. Even those who are not sick, they are not strong enough. But now the roles have reversed. Now they are being forced to take care of these ones who are now going to drink and they are on the street. But the, the, I believe the reason why the Lord spoke to me about the elderly, it's because we tend to, to look more at the orphans, the widows, and the elderly is like they are pushed back there mm -hmm. and they are suffering. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we should start, I, I hope and I believe that uh, in Kenya, we should start to think about homes for the elderly. It's not something I would have loved for our country. I would have loved that we continue with love, that spirit of love where we are taking care of each other. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a very, uh, it has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. Because when you have your uh, elderly in an uh, elderly home, mm -hmm. you cannot compare it to uh, with them being at home. Yeah. But now instead of them being out there suffering, they, they are not even accorded their di uh, dignity anymore then it's better for them to be in an elderly home where people know what they are doing because some of them they need even to be changed the the what do you call the the for the the dear parts for the oh yeah yeah, some mm. of them need this kind of thing. Mm. So you see, when you have an elderly home, you need even different kind of workers. You need those who will uh, take care of the washing part, the cleaning part, and then you need those with uh, the kind of skills I have who will concentrate with the, the brain uh, and, and their dignity and their self-confidence. So I think we should consider this. Mm -hmm. And I actually forgot to, uh, to mention that I have also a land uh, where I come from in Embu, yeah. where um, I, I also want to have that elderly home, among other things. So this is a project that is now, uh, it's, it's, a, it's on the ground level, but it's a project that I, I want uh, to build for the elderly, that they can have a place. So I would encourage, because one person or two or a few is not enough, I would encourage that people would consider that, because it's now being, it's now, it's needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. we actually celebrated the um, International Day of the Elderly yeah. People just the yeah. other day. Yeah. Just the other day. So yeah. I, I think whatever you're saying is really important. Whereby we have somewhere where those who uh, we are not saying we abolish our tradition completely whereby we look after our people we look after our people we don't take them somewhere else yeah. for them to be taken care of but we should have more of these facilities for those who don't have people yeah. to look after them so uh, i believe it's a good initiative yeah. that uh, that you're taking upon right now and maybe what what do you feel or who do you feel should join in this um in order to just have places like um whatever you want to to build actually vivian everyone everyone mm. Everyone has something to offer. You see, even the poor have something to give. Everyone. Mm -hmm. St starting, of course, with the government. But I think we are in a place where we should be doing things without even waiting for the government. There are things we have waited for decades mm -hmm. for the government to do. Mm -hmm. So I think we should have the, that, papa, uh, that passion yeah. for some, some things like what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. To be able to say even if the government is doing this and there is something I can do, uh, let me be taking the first steps. So as the government or as the other, uh, someone else joins, a uh, joint board, mm -hmm. we are already doing something. But this waiting for, for one another, I think it's what is causing the country to be where it is because I think we should move. If you, if you feel you should move, you should move. And I said that uh, even the poor uh, have, have something, something to give. offer have mm -hmm. something to offer mm -hmm. this is uh it's also biblical that's where i get to this principle even the poor have something to offer no one can say i don't have anything to give even these people i reach out to they have something to give and you see we have to encourage that giving spirit also mm -hmm. even with the poor mm -hmm. because if they are not encouraged also to that you have something to give they will remain with that uh, poverty mentality and they will not move forward but when we show them what you're giving me i actually need it because I might be bringing you something that you think maybe is big, is huge, is expensive. You might be giving me something that is not expensive, but it's something that is, that is expensive in another way. Mm -hmm. So this is also what I encourage. And it also creates uh, an atmosphere where now even the self-esteem uh, uh, is, is, is uh, the health of the self-esteem is now being even uh, uh, 
better. So I think we should encourage that. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe as we, as we wind up, how are you reaching out to young people? So to young people, I'm reaching out to them through social media and uh, word of mouth. And I also go to them. And uh, sometimes it's even one. Mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, someday I might even uh, help one. Some days I might call a meeting mm -hmm. and we sit together with several of them. Mm -hmm. So for me, I don't limit myself. I believe the Lord honors my feet. Sometimes it may be one, sometimes ten, sometimes a hundred. So that's how I reach out to them. Okay. And how has that been? You know, you working closely with the youth as well. How has that been for you? It's good. It's great. Because, you know, with the youth, the kind of youth we have now, it's another generation. We need to approach them in a very different way. And this is what also I'm telling people that uh, when we approach the youth, sometimes we might think this person is stubborn, this mm -hmm. person is rebellious, mm -hmm. but we are functioning from a different kind of wants, you know, because now even their thinking is different. So, uh, you know, when I, when, I, when I approach the youth, I like to show them what they can do. For example, these books, yeah, we designed, um, okay, my son and I, sorry, mm -hmm. my son and I, we didn't know how to decide book covers. Eh? I was supposed to give this work to somebody, mm -hmm. but there was some kind of delay and everything. And I believe it's the, the leading of the Lord. I told uh, my son, we can do this, come, let us inform ourselves. We learned to do this from uh, YouTube. Because now YouTube is full of uh, so much uh, information, we can do, we can learn much from there. So that's why we learned how to to design the the book cover. You see, in the process, I even save money for that. You can use that money for something else. Mm -hmm. So I, I, this is what I'm telling the youth: there are things like a book design you can do. There are things, uh, digital things you can do, web design. Some are not well informed. Like we said, some may think even these things are, are so big for them. So for me is to show them, to try to see, to sit down with them. And when I meet them, I don't tell them first about the, the, these huge things. Sometimes I may go with them somewhere, uh, buy for them a cup of tea, I have lunch with them. If it's a lady and I'm able, I can go to a salon. In the process, you know, the person will, will now see this is not an enemy even if she's older than me this is actually a friend so now from that after that mm -hmm. then I can go deeper I okay. can introduce other things, uh, other things. That's how I deal with the youth. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Karimi, for joining us. Thank right. you for coming on the show. And um, thank you for the job that you're doing out here with the community. It is very, very commendable. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, this is where we put a cup to today's show. Thank you so much to each and every one of you who has been tuning in to Good Morning Kenya. I have been your host, Vivian Degwa, and now we head direct to the Senate proceedings.